Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the conference organizers and sponsors for having me um, here today. I'm going to talk about our Tufts of Tech program, um, but before I get to that, I'm going to sort of build on kind of the background with um, accessible care and kind of give you guys kind of the context for why we're even talking about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the goals of accessible care programs, what these programs do, how they work, um, how, what are some um, ways that we can engage with the community. And then I'm going to talk specifically about how working with an educational institution can be helpful to your organization's mission. So obviously most of you guys are probably not going to be partnering with a veterinary school, but a lot of the things I'm going to talk about, there may be another kind of school or educational program that you could partner with. I'm um, going to sort of talk about like why that might be advantageous. Um, definitely, I'm not the only expert in this in the room. I've worked kind of behind the scenes to help set up our program um, and thought a lot about what this means for veterinary medicine going forward and how we can pull in um, partners on animal welfare. But there's a lot of people with a lot more expertise um, who kind of work this every day. So definitely open to hearing input from everyone else. Um, and then also clearly recognize the strengths and limitations of academia. So there's some great things about being at the university. We can try things that other folks might not be able to get away with. But um, it, to some extent, it's not the real world, um, which I'm very aware of. And a lot of what we do is trying to make our training for our vet students more real world so that they will be more employable um, in the kind of programs that you guys work with. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is a picture of the Worcester Technical High School, which is where our clinic um, that I'm going to be talking about today is based. And um, this is the signage. And the name of the clinic was um, came up with by the high school students. The logo was designed by the students at the Technical High School in the Graphics Department. And the sign was actually made by the um, the uh, mechanics students. So everything in the clinic um, involves the students in some way. So what I want to do today is give you guys some background and context for this program, why we have it, what we're trying to do with it, um, give you some suggestions about what makes these programs work, kind of challenge some of your assumptions if you're new to the field of accessible care, you haven't really thought about how this fits in with shelter medicine. I just kind of want to bring that up to your consciousness and talk about why we're doing this um, and talk a little bit about how shelter medicine and community medicine relate to each other. So what is community medicine? Community medicine is a really common term in human medicine. It means something. It's something that you can study. Um, it spans the discipline of primary care, public health, and epidemiology. Epidemiology is sort of the study of um, disease and, and risk um, in health. In veterinary medicine, we don't really have a universally accepted formal de um, definition, and I would call this an emerging discipline. So my definition, I call it community-based veterinary medicine. So you could simply say this is putting veterinary medicine at the level of the community. Um, I define it as veterinary care delivered directly to community members with the goal of impacting companion animal health and welfare. But the thing that's really unique about it is that we are trying to benefit not just the animal, but the community itself. So we're really thinking about the people that we're serving and how we can reach them through veterinary care or whatever else it is that our agency is offering. So we want to improve access to care for animals and communities that are not reached by traditional models of care delivery due to barriers such as cost, transportation, culture, um, or language. And we want to use animal health programs to improve social capital and engagement within communities. We find that the animal is a unifying force within community members. So no matter what I look like and no matter what my client looks like, we are united by the love of the animal. So this is a powerful force that we are privileged to be able to harness and um, you know, change our communities with. And then um, in animal welfare and in veterinary medicine, we are um, hampered by the fact that we are very um, non-diverse. So veterinary medicine is the least diverse profession in healthcare. It's a 96% white profession. So if we don't start to have role models who look like all community members, we are not going to fix that problem. So studies show that little kids think about what they can grow up by looking at what they see around them. So if we don't have veterinarians of color and technicians of color and staff of color we are never going to change our profession. So we take this really seriously at the schools that we want to increase a diversity pipeline and make shelters and veterinary medicine something that's accessible to everyone. 
So why would this be something of interest to shelters? First of all, shelters are mission driven. So we're all kind of here to help animals. We're all kind of here to help the world a better place, make the world a better place. So this fits very much with our ethic. And in some parts of the country, <clears throat> like New England where I work, we are starting to think about what is our mission and how is our mission changing? Because things look really different in the shelters in New England than they looked like even 10 years ago. This is a study that the Center for Shelters Dog, Shelter Dogs did in 2016 where we were talking to um, sheltering organizations about programs that they offered to community members. And so in blue, the first part is we asked shelter industry folks, why do people give up their pets? So almost half of shelter industry folks thought that finances was the most important reason somebody would give up their pet. And then um, animal behavior was the second reason um, that people thought that they would give up their pet. And if you look through the relinquishment li literature, um, you can see that in the earlier literature, there's a lot about these animal-based reasons why people might give up their pets. So peeing, scratching, you know, aggression, all those types of things. And then as we kind of get into this era, there's more about people-related factors. So moving, landlord conflict, military deployment are becoming important reasons. And so really what we know is that it's a lot more complicated than that. It's never just one thing, it's multiple things. So when someone has a challenge in their family, the pet becomes at risk. So our shelter partners, our shelter industry folks are telling us that they wanna do things to address this problem. So here is the programs that people offer. So orange is what they offer. So things like food banks, low cost spay neuter, um, a veterinary fund, low cost veterinary care. Those are what people currently offer and yellow is what they're considering offer. So many shelters are already providing veterinary care or considering offering veterinary care or other resources like behavior or food to help clients that may be having a hard time. So in shelter medicine today, we're becoming really good at targeting at-risk animals. We would like to keep animals out of the shelter altogether. We would like to keep all the animals with the families that love them. Um, and we're realizing that there's a whole bunch of people that never come to us. They don't come to adopt from us. They don't come to surrender from us. They have pets within the community. They get them from community members. If they need to be rehomed, they rehome them within the community. Um, and so we don't reach them, which means that not only do they not get animals from us or bring us animals, but we don't get to give them all of our messages about spaying and neutering and um, you know, responsible dog ownership and dog training and all the great information that you and your staff have doesn't reach most pet owners. And in New England, we're also seeing things like if your municipal shelter is empty, you can do things like send your animal control officers out to talk to people. You can do things like parvo vaccine clinics and deal with the rates of parvo in the inner city because you have time and you have energy and you have resources for this. So it's looking really different when you don't have tons and tons of animals coming in. Many shelters and animal welfare organizations have always offered veterinary care. So um, in my area, there's a whole bunch of, of of old organizations that have always done this. In New York, you know, we talked on Friday night about um, the ASPCA in Brooklyn, and we all know about the Berg Memorial, um, which is now the ASPCA Animal Hospital. So they have always had veterinary care as part of their mission. And unfortunately, this kind of gets stuck in this political um, debate. And so we have a lot of discord around this. And in my profession particularly, there seems to be this prevailing ethic that nonprofits should not be in the business of medicine, which baffles me. Because if you think about the human sector, there's, no, there's nothing about being a nonprofit that means you can't offer medical care. So we do now have the HSVMA guiding principles, which basically say all dogs and cats deserve access to veterinary care. And that as veterinarians, that is our ethical duty, but we still see state legislation which is introduced to try to limit what nonprofits can do in this space. And we have continued discord around income screening, the best use of resources, what we're allowed to do as a nonprofit. So I just bring this up to kind of consider like, why is this so difficult? Like, why can't we figure out an answer here? Community outreach is a big part of what we do in sheltering. So these are just some pictures of my students um, talking to community members about spay neuter, talking to one of our ACOs about spay neuter, talking to pet owners about veterinary care at a health fair in an underserved part of our community. 
And this is one of the earliest studies that was done to show that um, we can map animal welfare along with human um, health and social disparities. So this was done by my mentor, Dr. Petronic, at the Animal Rescue of Boston in 2010. And essentially what he did was he looked at the areas of Boston that had the most cat intake, um, and he found that they tracked right along with the areas where people were doing the worst. So they had the highest um, infant mortality rates, the lowest lifespan, the highest rates of all kinds of poverty-related health and social problems, tracked with where cats were at high risk. So those go together. Anytime you have people who are struggling to access resources, it's going to affect the animals as well. There was a tiny little anecdotal uh, section of his paper, which was about Alliance for Animals, which was a really old um, hospital in Boston that had done low-cost spay-neuters for years. Um, and they actually found that that neighborhood was, the cats in that neighborhood were not at increased risk um, for surrendering to their shelter. So that is just one tiny little anecdote, but it was kind of taken as evidence that you know, interventions, if you, if you bring resources to where the animals are, you can actually improve things for animals. And so we've been doing this for a long time. So we know in New England, 90% of owned cats and dogs are spayed and neutered. So we know we have to go out there and get those animals that aren't coming to us. So this is the Animal Rescue League spay wagon. This is at Massasoit Community College. So they're going all over certain areas south of Boston to try to bring spay neuter to that 10% of folks that we're not reaching um, normally. And this is folks lining up at 6 a.m. for spay neuter on their way to work. Um, because it's offered to them at a free or affordable price. Um, and we looked at some of this. So this is a study that one of my students did in 2008 where we looked at, OK, who are these people that are using low cost um, spay neuter in Massachusetts? Um, and we were really interested in what kind of veterinary care do cat owners that use our clinics go on to provide? And we found that over 60% of the cats had never, ever been to the vet before other than coming to the spay neuter clinic. And this was the, the lower their income, the more likely it was that they had never seen a vet. And this number, 60 to 70 percent, in any study that you see where they look at underserved populations of veterinary care, is repeated. So it, hands down, about 70 percent of folks in these communities will not come to a veterinarian. So if you ever hear veterinarians say that you're stealing their business, you can tell them it's not true. These are people that will not come to the veterinarian. They can't. They can't afford it. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about this study was that most of the cats were casually acquired. So meaning they didn't, you know, a lot of times we say, well, you know, if you're going to have a cat, you got to be responsible. you got to provide this and that the other. Um, you now have this responsibility. That's the way we think in animal welfare. We think that it's a lifelong commitment, that we have all these obligations towards the pet. Um, we have an industry in veterinary medicine that is framed around discretionary income and the luxury of pet owning. But reality is that these are just people living their lives, not knowing particularly a lot about cats, and cats show up. That's what they do. And 25% of the American public feeds cats. So the person thinks that they have done a compassionate thing. They have fed the cat. They have let the cat in. They are now having a relationship with a cat. It wasn't like they planned it. Or maybe somebody moved and left them their cat. Or somebody went to jail and left them their cat. Or somebody deployed and left them their cat. So it's not like with a lot of intent, you know. And I think this is particularly true of cats as opposed to dogs. Um, so in the client's mind, they have got this cat as an act of compassion, and they're doing this great thing. It doesn't necessarily, in their mind, convey, convey to this obligation to spend hundreds of dollars at the veterinarian. So I think that's important to keep that in mind. Um, and then most of our clients say that they intended to sterilize their pets eventually, but finance or access or knowledge of the proper age got in their way. Um, and then when we asked them, because my student talked to them a year later, has your cat been to the vet? The, the main reason they said no was because their cat wasn't sick. So, and I think about that in my own life, you know, I don't really tend to go to the doctor unless I absolutely have to, I'm pretty busy. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of our clients. So I bring this up just so that we can think about the kind of judgments that we have about people and realizing all the things that folks are up against and try to have less judgment. So things that we don't really know, we don't really know whether, I have this idea that, okay, they're going to come to the spay neuter clinic and they're going to see how awesome we are and then they're going to come back every year for their shots. And I think that probably works for some people, but I think there's a lot of people that may not come back um, for follow-up care 
because whatever was keeping them from being able to access services at a sort of a regular veterinarian, those factors are still present in that family's life going forward. And so if we don't do some work to overcome those barriers, it's possible that they're not going to go on to get care. Through spay neuter and working with different kinds of clients than we've worked with before, we are reaching pet owners that we never used to see. So we're getting, as a field, an increasing awareness of all the pets that are out there um, that need our help. And we're forming relationships with clients who then desire to have um, a lifelong relationship with us. So they are now looking to us um, for the kinds of things that um, anybody would look for for their pet from their veterinarian. So, you know, in spay and neuter, we tend to think of it as a one-off, like, okay, we're done, we're done with you. But in the client's mind, we are now their veterinarian. And we've set the expectation with the client that we can provide for them. So I think that this is a natural evolution of outreach and spay and neuter has led to this. So the big problem is not everyone can access veterinary care. We don't really know how to deal with it. We get into these debates. And of course, we all know that we haven't solved this problem for people. So it's really easy for us to get pushed to the sideline or to get trivialized in the conversation about how we reach humans. And that's why I emphasize how much our programs can help um, people in that if we can get allies in other agencies that provide um, other services to people in, in communities, we can have a seat at the table and they can realize that we can use our animal programs to help gain access to community members that may not trust, may not be willing to work with us. So some of the things that are driving this are the lower shelter population. So in New England, it's not uncommon, especially in the winter, to have pretty empty shelters. Um, this increasing awareness of the community needs and expectations and then the costs just keep going up. So, and I think Jocelyn talked about this, like the cost is moving beyond where ordinary people cannot afford it. Um, and so if the veterinary profession doesn't do something about the cost, we're gonna have an increasingly large number of pet owners who are not able to come to us. And it's not a sustainable model for, for veterinarians if no one can afford us. Surrender prevention is a tough one because like I said, um, certainly we all see animals coming in like with sort of a medical surrender situation all the time and I think we're a lot of us are moving more towards hopefully I can help you fix that problem especially if it's something simple and keep the animal then surrender it and fix it and give it to a new home rather than the home where they love it um, but a lot of folks that we're reaching through these programs are not going to ever come to the shelter so it's not that if that not for us, people aren't going to be keeping their pets. Most people love their pets and want to keep their pets. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that their pets, just because their pet's not at risk of relinquishment, doesn't mean that it doesn't deserve veterinary care or vaccines or access to basic services. So in veterinary medicine, I talk about um, healthcare disparities, who's underserved. So it tends to be the homeless animals, so shelter animals that we all take care of, free roaming cats, they're just kind of out there, nobody necessarily is um, paying for their vet bill. Um, and then low income pet owners that have trouble accessing um, mainstream veterinary medicine. And we know from a lot of studies that low income pet owners are at the highest risk to not vaccinate and to not spay neuter. And we know that there's about 23 million pets that live in poverty. So this chart just shows um, different income brackets in the United States um, and how pet ownership relates to that. So you can see that between 50 and 60% of Americans own pets. It doesn't matter their income. So you have a little bit less at the lowest income bracket, but by and large, it's between 50 and 60% at every income bracket. So I would argue that the average veterinarian is targeting clients who make $85,000 or more household income. So what about all of these people in the middle, which is most of people? Probably our subsidized programs where we're providing free care, probably they are targeting mostly this, these lower brackets, but we really need to do something about the middle range here. So this is a chart that we use a lot to talk about um, availability of services. So most people have heard of things like a food desert, which is an area of an underserved, um, usually inner city community where they can't access fresh food. And the same is true for veterinary care or even things like um, Petco or PetSmart. They don't tend to be located in some of these areas of the inner city. So this one um, is just showing the red dots is where all the veterinarians are 
and then this is where sort of the lowest income area is and that you can see that is why the ASPCA is targeting this area for their outreach because there's nothing there. There's nobody to get angry, there's nobody there. Um, the clients just cannot get to the veterinarian, there isn't one. Um, and in New York City, it's hard to take your pet in public transportation. And this graph talks about systemic poverty. And so this is where you have generations of people. So it's really important to understand, as a veterinarian, I'm not educated in, in poverty. I'm educated in health. And so a lot of times we have assumptions and just realizing that poverty isn't a choice that people make. It's because of the circumstances that they're in. It, it's systematic um, social structures that have existed for generations. And so we have areas of the rural parts of the United States and in the cities where generations of people have lived in poverty. And this really affects um, everything about their lives and their ability to be able to provide for them, their families and their pets. So some of the kind of barriers that we see in these communities, cost is obviously um, a huge one, but it's not the only one. Like I said, um, transportation is really important. Language is also important. There's a number of studies that show that your client really prefers that the veterinarians speak their language. Um, and so in our community, Spanish is a big language. Many of our clients are Spanish speaking. Very few of my veterinarians or veterinary students are Spanish speaking. So that is something that we really need to do um, a better job of if we're gonna adequately serve our clients. Culture and awareness are something we see a lot. We have a lot of um, Portuguese people in, in the community that we work. And um, it's more common in like a Mediterranean country to have free roaming cats just kind of around. Um, and so our clients may not think that that's an issue. And so just kind of sharing what we think of as kind of the American approach to pet keeping can kind of raise that awareness with the clients, especially if we give them the tools um, to kind of follow through, obtain spay neuter, for example. Um, and then drug addiction, mental health issues, not having a clinic in your neighborhood, um, and just everything else that you have to get through in your daily life, all those things can affect our client's ability to come to us. We have a lot of controversies, so whether or not we income screen, um, there's a lot of talk about, well, you know, they have this really nice cell phone or they have this really nice car. But from an animal welfare perspective, it really doesn't matter why the animal's not getting the care. The animal's not getting the care. So our job is to break down barriers, not to put up barriers. So the more we worry about the person that's going to take advantage of us, that's the less people that we can help. So we really want to frame our programs around helping as many people as we can. And whether we like it or not, animals are always going to be living with people that can't provide what we would consider the ideal standard. So I'm going to talk a little bit about community medical centers. So this is really, really common in human medical education. Any medical school will have a community clinic. And it's very understood what the mission is. The mission is to care for the uninsured population. So it's very clear, um, and there isn't a lot of controversy about it. And the reason medical schools do this is because it provides students the opportunity for hands-on learning. Um, and then it also incorporates an aspect of service learning into the education. And I'll talk about what that is in a minute. And then cultural competency. So again, not being a particularly diverse profession, we need to give our students experiences of engaging with clients from all different kinds of backgrounds if they're gonna be competent practitioners. So what service learning is, is kind of a combination of volunteering and education, but it's more, it's like the two experiences are enhanced by being together. So the students will learn from hands-on, but there's this element of reflection. So they're thinking about, as they're doing this, they're thinking about their role as a medical professional in the community and how it's impacting them personally and how it's impacting their career choices. Um, and so it's integrated, it's collaborative. We also emphasize civic responsibility. So as a veterinarian or a veterinary technician or um, a member of the veterinary or shelter team, you are a citizen and you have a responsibility towards your community and you're representing your institution and that means something. So we talk about that with the students, we assess that with the students and we incorporate reflection. So they're thinking about you know, what actually is going on in the client's life that, you know, are they going to be able to comply with this treatment plan? Is there a treatment plan that you could pick that would actually be more, um, more practical for the client? And how do you figure that out? How do you have a respectful conversation with the client that leads to a treatment plan that they can actually implement? 
So it's not exactly like an internship. It's not exactly like volunteering. It's kind of putting them both together, um, giving them an opportunity to gain practice ready skills while serving the community. So in general, what can we do to provide more veterinary care to more different clients? And what is the level of care that all pets deserve? There's some terms that you want to keep in mind. So one thing that you want to keep in mind, especially if you're talking to veterinarians, is that price is not the same thing as cost. So we might be able to offer free or low price care because of philanthropy, because you have donor dollars that you can use to offset the cost, but it doesn't mean that the cost, that the care costs less, right? So in some settings, like in academia, we might be able to get things donated to us for using and teaching, but most of the time, everything costs the same. So in America, we kind of have this negative stereotype about low, low price or cheap, but really we want to be careful at making um, making an assumption that it costs less. It actually costs the same, it's just that we've lowered the price to something that our client can be able to afford. Accessibility and affordability are also not the same thing, so when you talk about access, it has to do with more than just the price. We want to make sure that we use respectful language when we talk about communities, community members and our clients. So we try to talk about things like underserved populations, recognizing that, again, it's not that we're blaming the, the client for the situation. Like this is to do with systemic factors in society that none of us actually are going to be able to fix, fix, but we're just acknowledging that our clients are facing these challenges. And then we also have differences in racial and ethnic disparities compared to economic disparities. And that's going to look different in different communities. So it's really, really important that you understand your community and what would be beneficial where you want to work. Um, insurance is a big thing. So in, in human medicine, um, we have done better with insurance with Obamacare. So now you're seeing different things that people are struggling with. So it seems to be things like mental health services, um, addiction therapies, vision care are things that folks are struggling with. Basic care they can often get um, through Obamacare. So, um, so there's differences in exactly how the system works. And transportation is a big thing. So how the veterinarian communicates with the client impacts, impacts all of these things. So there's a lot of studies in the veterinary literature that talk about how uncomfortable veterinarians are about talking about money with clients. And so the relationship that the veterinarian has with the client in whatever the context is really, really important. So a lot, there's, um, there is an element of shame with clients that can't afford services. So one of the things that we're really working on is trying to have our, our students be confident in having financial conversations with clients and really having a realistic discussion with them about what is affordable for that client and what options exist within the sphere of what we can offer. Because as you talked about last hour, we're not going to be able to offer every possible treatment option to every possible client. Like everyone's going to be offering within the constraints of limited resources. But how can we have those conversations in a respectful way and help the client identify the best solution for them? Um, I talked a little bit about language before. I think having bilingual staff, having Spanish for veterinarians, having whatever language is common in your community is really, really important. Um, other things we need to be careful with, especially in animal welfare, we get really fired up about client education, like, and that is really a phrase that we should just purge from our vocabulary. So we like to talk about information sharing. Um, this is a vaccine event at Dakin. So these are clients that are waiting for free vaccines. Um, they went into the neighborhood because they were having a little uptake in parvo cases, and the, the Board of Health asked them to come in. Um, and so while they're waiting, the staff is just kind of chatting with folks and sharing information with them. But you'll find out a lot of other needs and things that clients have, like maybe um, about questions about pet care, questions about uh, pet food, questions about dentistry, um, senior care. Um, so it's very similar to what might be going on with the client themselves. So just respectful engagement with the community is really important. So in human medicine, you have a lot of low price clinics in inner city, in teaching hospitals, we have insurance, we have some payment plan options, and we have government aid. We don't necessarily have all of those for veterinary care, um, and we definitely need a lot more education and cultural competence. So we're trying to talk to these things about our, with our students. Another thing that's important is 
having the initiative be community led. So in animal welfare, sometimes we get our crusader capes on, we're like, we're gonna swoop in and solve all your problems. But we really need to make sure that we're identifying um, community partners who are inviting us in. Um, so either we're employing community members or community partners have invited us in and that we've done the groundwork to figure out what is the need and that we're gonna be successful that way. Um, so we really wanna have it at the level of the community and not just like dropping in and dropping out. That causes a lot of mistrust. Another thing that I wanna mention is just this idea of the standard of care. So these are some quotes from some faculty at vet schools that we surveyed. And so this person is talking about how um, as, the, as the standard of care is rising, um, we're having increased pressure to treat cases that we might not have treated 30 years ago and that this is rising the cost of care um, and also specialization. So the more we have specialty options for pets, which is great, but the more that makes it expensive and the more it makes things that used to be done by a general practitioner out of reach of the general practitioner. Um, and so then it raises the cost so there are fewer families that can afford it. And this is kind of a common attitude. So it says, I believe those in low income situation don't have the ability to pay for care, but they also don't have the ability to transport them. But pets are optional and should be owned by people that can afford them. And this is a, one of my clients. So she's um, a mom with two kids and she's actually battling a pretty severe cancer. Um, and this is their cat. And so, you know, for them, the cat is really, really important for those kids. And I don't really want to tell them that they shouldn't have the cat. So I think if you're going to do this work, you have to kind of accept that people deserve their pets. Okay, so I want to talk about some of the existing programs that are out there and how they work. And, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our program. So there are lots of programs that target underserved pet owners, but before we started looking into this, we weren't really sure how many there were, and we weren't really sure how they all worked. So we did a little survey just to kind of see what was out there in the landscape. And we were interested in what are the models, how do they work, and where are the sort of um, areas we could target to either replicate or scale up. Um, and we wanted to know, like, not just um, what the nonprofits were doing, um, not just what subsidized care, but what were people in private practice doing for clients that couldn't afford their services? And we kind of had this idea we were going to map, map them out, which turned out to be a little harder than we thought it would be. So what we did is we looked at publicly available information state by state just to see what was out there. And then we picked specific clinics to talk to them about their model and try to find out how they worked. So initially we found 10,000 veterinary clinics. In, there were 10,000 veterinary clinics in the United States. And of those, there was about 2,250 that seemed to possibly meet the criteria of offering some kind of accessible care. So that could be because they advertised something at a lower price or it could be that um, somebody told us that, oh, if you want to get a good deal, you know, go to that veterinarian. And then it would also include things like your low-cost spay-neuter and programs that were specifically targeted. So we were able to get more detailed information, about 440 of them. The most, the most people who would talk to us were the nonprofits. They were usually happy to chat with us. The general practitioners, even the ones where somebody else in their town said, oh, yeah, that guy will work with folks, they were totally unwilling to talk to us. So I don't know whether that's because vets are just super busy and it's hard to get them on the phone, which is definitely true, or whether they don't want it known that they do this because then it would have more impact on their business than they could handle, or if there's some stigma about a veterinarian who's trying to offer affordable care, I don't know. But suffice it to say, it was much easier to talk to nonprofits than it was private practice veterinarians. And then we talked to, in depth, to 20 clinics and programs. So this is the map of the 440 where they were. So you can see that they're in every state. Some of the bigger states have a lot. So there were uh, 45 programs that we could find in California. There's a whole bunch in Texas. Um, the only state that had nothing was Wyoming. But every other state had at least one program that qualified. And here's some of the services that they offered. So preventative medicine was common, um, spay neuter as you would expect, really, really common. But everything else all over the map, we even found one low-cost cat declaw place, if you can believe it, um, even exotics. So quite a hodgepodge of what people were offering. So 
quick impressions, um, there is some access to vet care in various capacities in different communities. A lot of times this was done through word of mouth, just through knowing who to talk to in a community. Um, there were also some nonprofits who ran um, veterinary clinics, um, you might call it like a regular practice model, and they used the revenue from the practice to support their rescue mission. So there are definitely organizations that have done this, that have found financial success through that. Um, discussion of this is really difficult. People are talking about apples and oranges, private vets don't want to talk to you. There are a lot of emotionally charged um, aspects to this conversation that makes it hard. These are some of the types of clinics we saw. So we saw nonprofit vet clinics. We saw for-profit vet clinics that were specifically targeting clients seeking affordable care. We saw some for-profit clients that clinics that just made exceptions for individual clients, which is what I think is probably more common than we can measure. Um, and then we saw things like nonprofit spay neuter clinics that would occasionally make an exception, like oh we'll do that cystotomy or oh yeah we'll help you with that pio. Um, and then targeted community programs where they're specifically trying to help a particular community. So many veterinary clinics say they never offer low cost options and we certainly see that as well. So those are the pyometras that come to the spay neuter clinic because they just can't find a veterinarian that can do it for a price they can afford. Um, over 90% of regular veterinarians that we contacted declined to participate, whereas half of the nonprofit clinics would talk to us. Um, all of the um, clients, or all the clinics that we talked to, didn't restrict, um, didn't really do income screening. Um, some of them had a sliding scale. <clears throat> Most of them were targeted based on location. So it was for a particular area, and that's how they screened. Um, and like I said before, some Nonprofits were able to fund their rescue mission through providing wellness service to full, full paying clients. Um, some of the things that were sort of interesting, so only half offered hours after five. Um, most worked on appointments. So you think about you know, inner city working people, something like evening hours or walk-in availability is gonna be really important. Most of the programs reported good, good relationships with the veterinarians, so, and, and we've seen that to be true in our area, so veterinarians tend to look at these um, cl clinics as, um, as options, so if they have a client that can't afford what they can offer, they like to have places they can send them. Um, very few programs have everything as free. You have to have quite a lot of um, donor, uh, donor base to be able to do everything for free, um, and then many are associated with an educational program. I'm going to talk to you now. So I think this is an opportunity. I think that the, the option for a standalone nonprofit model um, is out there. There's certainly a need in the community. We classified these into um, six different types. So free clinic, a spay neuter clinic, a wellness clinic, a limited service clinic would be something like, um, you know, just dentistry or just dentistry and vaccines and maybe a spay. A full service clinic does everything like a general practice would. And then sometimes it's a general practice and then they have some options for clients that have affordability issues. So I'm gonna turn now to talk specifically about our program at Tufts. So the vet school at Tufts is called Coming School. This is a picture of it here. And we have a long-term culture of international community outreach. One of the other things is we were among the last schools to develop a rotation in primary care. Because we have a super busy emergency service, our students would see um, regular things pretty, pretty um, often. And so there wasn't a huge motivation to set up a primary care service like they have here at Cornell and some of the other schools. There was a lot of fear among the administration that if they opened up a general practice, that there would be um, conflict with referring veterinarians. And they were really anxious to be stepping on the toes of our alums and our regular um, practitioners, which I've definitely seen at other schools when they've thought about setting up programs. Um, you really need to make sure that your veterinary community is supportive. Um, the school across the whole university really encourages what they call active citizenship, meaning um, thinking about yourself and your role in the community in your future career and how you're going to give back. And they have a One Health focus, so kind of like the stuff that Dr. O'Quinn was talking about on Friday night, how we can do programs that help public health and human health while we're helping animals. Um, so we are located in um, North Grafton. The, so Boston is here, and that's where the main campus is, but the vet school is out here. And the closest community to us was Worcester. Um, and so the, the Hofstra University has a kind of university-wide goal of engaging 
their host communities. So the medical schools in Chinatown, so there's a lot of outreach with the medical students to the Chinatown population and the dental school actually does a ton of outreach for community members. Um, so we looked at Worcester, which is an underserved city compared to Boston, which is kind of a mecca of animal welfare organizations. There isn't a lot in Worcester. There's 180,000 people, so it's a fairly big, it's actually the second largest town in New England, city in New England, and it's very, very culturally diverse. Um, about a third of the people in Worcester speak a language other than English, and 15% live below the poverty line with a median household income is 36,000, which for Massachusetts, um, which is a relatively affluent blue state, that is very, very low. Um, and so students, um, Dr. Aziz is actually here, one of the students that was instrumental in launching this program, <coughs> they had launched an outreach program um, going back to 2008. Um, where they were providing basic vaccinations for uh, clients living in public housing. Um, and so we partnered with a vet tech school to provide, um, to provide basic care. And we have first and second year vet students going out there. And that program, through the energy of the students, really grew over the years um, to the point where last year we saw 511 dogs and cats um, in the public housing units. And we've expanded services over the years so they can have spay neuter vouchers to come to campus to our on-campus on spay neuter clinic. We have cab vouchers to deal with the fact that um, most of our clients can't drive um, or don't drive or don't own a car. Um, and then um, we've reached other pet owners, so we have vulnerably housed population through some various um, soup kitchen sites and things like that. So through this program, we be, really became aware that there was quite a population of clients in Worcester that weren't able to access veterinary care. And that led to the opening of the Tufts at Tech Clinic um, in 2012. So this is a full service veterinary clinic. It's located in the target community of Worcester. It's about 15 minutes from the campus of the vet school. And it really has two goals. So um, one goal is to provide a, a clinical training site for students. And it's not just the veterinary students, it's also the high school students. So the high school students in the, in the vocational or the technical high school are enrolled in any number of trades. They have about 70 trades they can pick from. So the ones that we work with are enrolled in a veterinary assisting trade program. So they will spend two weeks of their high school time in a traditional academic curriculum, and then they'll spend two weeks in the veterinary assisting curriculum, and they rotate. So they're always in two groups of them. And when they graduate, they get a certificate of their their um, an, uh, registered veterinary assistant, which is a uh, it's just through NAVTA, so through the National Association of Veterinary Technicians. Um, so in the clinic, we have different populations of high school students. So they in the first year of high school, they're mostly involved in an academic program where they learn a curriculum around things you would need to know. So you know parasites and life cycles and um, vaccines and safe handling and that kind of thing is taught to them by their teachers who are generally CVTs and um, certified high school teachers. And then in the second year, they spend time in the clinic working as a reception, answering the phone, greeting the clients, um, working alongside our vet students. And then into the third year, they become sort of functioning veterinary assistants. And then when they're high school seniors, they actually go out into other community sites. Other veterinary um, clinics will host them on externships so they can get even more hands-on experience. So um, every Tufts veterinary student spends three weeks in this clinic minimum. They're all required to do three weeks. And that's their venue for where they learn primary care. And in this clinic, they are functioning as a doctor. So they're always supervised by doctors, but by and large, the supervisors don't talk to the clients. It's all done by the students, and all the procedures are performed by the students. So huge goal is teaching practice-ready students um, skills. And then the second goal, which is equally important, is serving the community. So we're, we are serving an underserved population um, at prices that our clients can afford. So if you look at these pictures, so this is actually the first surgery that was ever done at Tufts Head Tech. And you can see this is um, Kristen Kelly, who was originally from um, Sandra Newberry's program in Wisconsin, but graduated from the vet school um, about three or four years ago. So she's doing a biopsy on this cat who unfortunately had some kind of cancer in the mouth. And then these are other vet students who are assisting. But this is Dr. Wolfus, the clinic supervisor. And so the vet is like, deliberately in the background of this picture. The student is the one who's doing the procedure. 
Now, if you were to do a similar picture in the teaching hospital, you would see the opposite. The student would be kind of the third person back, barely able to see, and then the intern or residents would be here, and maybe the board certified surgeon would be there. And that right there is representative of the problem we have in veterinary medical education today, is that it's really hard to give hands-on training to the students. So by partnering with our clients who don't have a lot of options, it allows our students to be able to do the procedures. And we're very honest with the clients, so all the clients know it's for teaching and they know they're partnering with us. Um, they know that the reason why it costs less is because it's for teaching. Here's another example. So this is one of the vet students um, sitting down and talking to an owner um, after surgery and just going through the instructions of how to take care of the dog after space surgery. You can see they're already being super compliant with the e-collar use. Um, but this is an opportunity for them to go in depth and have a conversation with them about how they would take care of the pet. This is our staff, so it's obviously pretty tricky to staff a program like this. So we have a bunch of um, really, really experienced veterinary technicians. Um, this is Pam, who kind of serves as the manager, so kind of makes sure that everything works well. And then we have um, other vet techs, so that if the students run into trouble, something they don't know how to do or they aren't successful at doing it, the technicians can step in. When they also work with the high school students, so the high school students are at the front desk, they're being supervised by the veterinary technicians to make sure that they're giving the proper information and having the good conversations. This is kind of what it looks like on an average day. So there's, it's not a huge space. This is kind of the common treatment room. So this table they'll use for rounds. Over here they have a tiny little surgery room. And over here they have a tiny little radiology room. And you always have these little clusters. So anybody in a white coat is the um, vet student. So they're set up directly as a doctor. And then the other folks are the high school students. So they're always paired up. So every vet student has a little high school student buddy, and they see all the cases as a duo. Um, and that way, the high school student is learning from the vet student. The vet student learns by teaching. The other thing is, most of our high school students come from the community that we're targeting. So everybody in the high school gets free breakfast and lunch. That's how underserved the community is. Um, most of our students tell us that their pets didn't receive regular veterinary care before they got into this program and their pets became qualified um, patients. So they are representing their community. They are helping us teach our vet students to be more sensitive and responsive. They are also um, culturally diverse and Spanish speaking. So in this picture, Hector is talking to these clients about this pet in Spanish. So in their language, part of the healthcare team because we don't have HIPAA, we don't have privacy issues in veterinary care, we can just use a random high school student to translate. Um, and that works very well because Hector can talk to the vet student and to the client, um, and the clients are having an understanding of the plan for the pet. So we are hoping that these guys will go on to become community ambassadors and talk to their friends and neighbors about veterinary care, about animal welfare, about what they're learning in school, and that they will go on over 99% of the high school students go on to post high school education. Sometimes it's a two-year program, sometimes it's our uh, four-year program, but the hope is that some of them will go to veterinary school or veterinary technician school and help to restore um, a balance to the um, breakdown in diversity of our profession. So for the students, it's a huge benefit in their increase in confidence. They are acting as the doctors. We're getting them out of their comfort zone. So in this picture, um, I think they're doing a spay, but there's no veterinarian in sight. It's just the two students. So usually you'll have a student who's very comfortable with the procedure and a student who's learning it, and they will teach the other one. So it's kind of a see one, do one, teach one model. Um, and there's always a veterinary nearby, so if they get into trouble, we certainly never would want to jeopardize the welfare of an animal for the learning of the student, but by actually doing the procedure, it's a much more valuable experience for the student. Um, for the clients, the benefit is huge. So this is Dr. Wolves, so if you haven't met him, he's kind of like this, he looks like the big Lebowski. He's like this big, gregarious dude. Um, so he'll dress up as Santa Claus at Christmas time and he really like kind of mixes it up with the students and so there a lot of it is his personality and how they interact with it. But sometimes people say well you know are you taking advantage of these clients? And so I just put this picture up. This is Duchess who's one of our clients um, and her mom and Duchess came in for wellness and they diagnosed her with a mammary mass and there it happens to be that the um, surgeon at the vet school is doing a special study on 
um, a new way to treat uh, mammary cancer in dogs, but we don't see a lot of mammary cancer in the teaching hospital because they're all spayed, so they don't get it. So we're really interested in this population for that because they have the disease of interest. So because she was a client at Tufts at Tech, she was able to uh, um, obtain surgery and sort of a state-of-the-art treatment for her dog. And But for her, it was really more about finding something she wouldn't have known about if she didn't have access to the clinic and getting a treatment option for Duchess. And this is Duchess six months after the surgery doing well and she's still a client at Tufts of Tech and comes back to see us. So most of our clients are really grateful. They really appreciate um, the opportunity to provide care for their pets and to partner with us in the learning. Um, and so we have tons and tons of stories like that. We've looked a little bit at the clients. So um, most of them have income less than 25,000, which for a household for four is tiny. Um, most of them did never go to the vet on a regular basis before. Interestingly, 40% of our clients provide their pets with flea, tick, or heartworm prevention, even though they weren't able to access veterinary care, which to me speaks to the desire our clients have to provide the best for their pets. They really want to do what's best. Um, obviously, the clients that come to Tufts at Tech have less barriers than clients that aren't able to come to Tufts at Tech. So this is a recent paper that we looked at where we compared clients that we saw in outreach to clients coming at Tufts at Tech um, on a regular basis for wellness to clients who had come to Tufts at Tech just once. So obviously, if they aren't able to come to Tufts at Tech, there may be barriers that they're not over to overcome. So for the ones that do come, we are, we are demonstrating um, improvement in basic wellness care, basic preventative medicine. We have some other barriers we're still working on. Um, in particular, um, being on disability does not qualify for our clinic at the moment, and that's something a lot of our clients struggle with in the outreach setting. So hopefully as we grow, we'll be able to reach more and more people. Um, and there's just tons and tons of case examples. This one I like um, to talk about. This is Keiko, who... Um, was a dog that had an amputation for a catastrophic fracture. So he had his forelimb amputated by a veterinary student, and this is him the day of surgery. Um, he's outside peeing on the fence on three le two legs um, the day of surgery because they provided such excellent surgery and pain management to him. And we have another study. This is um, the first cat that I ever saw there that had a um, foreign body, and we have another paper that um, we operated I think 35 animals with foreign bodies operated by students, and only one of them didn't make it. So we have very good medical outcome um, with these patients that have really limited options. So again, just to kind of summarize and wrap up, um, the goal of these programs is to, act, to increase access to pets that would otherwise not receive care. These are definitely not traditional veterinary clients. Very few of the clients that we reach would ever receive services at a traditional veterinarian. Some of the keys to success, you really want to engage local veterinarians, kind of make sure that they understand what you're doing, understand what your mission is, invite them in. We offer um, opportunities to our referring vets to volunteer, just like we do in spay neuter. Um, and we find veterinarians love to do this. Obviously, having the students is a big motivator for them, but it gives them an opportunity to um, to give back and to have that interaction. And we found that even some of our toughest critics, once they come and see who our clients are and experience it for themselves, they all of a sudden kind of, it's like a light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, yeah, this is not my client. And they get it. Um, we want, you want to reach out to other sectors. You want to find community members who are willing to partner with you. Um, don't have this attitude of what I can do for you. Have it as what, what would you need from me? What, what would you like me to do for you? Some of the benefits of partnering with a school is that it allows space for innovation. So we are able to do things that some of the shelters in our community were afraid to try because they didn't want to tick off the vets. Um, having the enthusiasm and energy of learners is always awesome. And then for us, it's really helping us with that diversity pipeline. So again, it doesn't have to be a veterinary school. You could partner with a vet tech school. In Massachusetts, all of the vet tech programs now are looking at having a community program like ours. Um, and all, two other technical high schools have started programs, and they're not partnering with the vet school. Um, you could use a community college or any other educational program that would be interested in getting kids out into, a, into this kind of environment. So now that we understand the need, we really know that we need to do more. We want to, ex we want to promote a lifelong bond with all of our clients, with all pet owners. 
really, really important to know who you're reaching, to know who you're not reaching, um, and to measure the impact of your programs. And we have to figure out, again, not as an individual program or veterinarian, but as a field, how we can provide sustainable access for all pet owners. And my email's down here if you have any questions or want to get the slides. Thank you.